All right, so what else you got here? You got uh, you had you had West Nile. How'd you get that? I did have West Nile. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm assuming it was from a mosquito, but I had actually taken a trip. It was my senior year of high school that I got it. And um, I had a few weeks before I got it, I had taken a trip to uh, Saskatchewan, which is in Canada. It's just the next province over uh, from where I am. And I was visiting friends and we did a camping trip there where we went out. And that's the time that I'm thinking I got it just because I was out in the woods and uh, we spent the night like outside. So that's the time I'm thinking I got it. And What's up, everybody? This is Sean Dustin. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, it's good to have you with us. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Uh, if this is your first time listening, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, today is uh, September 14th. Uh, it's Monday. <laughs> Happy Monday, if uh, if you're going to work. Uh, if you want to support the show, uh, as always, you can subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite podcast platform. That's absolutely free. All it takes is a couple minutes of your time, and that would really, really, really help uh, you know get the show more visible out there on all the different platforms because the more uh, subscribers you get, you get boosted up higher on the, uh, on the visibility charts, and uh, you know, that's a free way to help the show. If you want to um, give a monetary donation, uh, you can always go to PayPal and send that to NorCal Drone Services at yahoo.com. Uh, monetary meaning like you can tip me if you want, if you like what I'm doing and you think it's uh, worthy of, of uh, shooting a tip, you can do it there. Uh, there's a Patreon page, which I'm slowly getting around to filling it up with content. Um, so, I mean, you can always subscribe there as well. Uh, what else? Uh, fires over here are still <clears throat> air quality is still horrible. Um, and as you can tell, I don't know if it's my, uh, my allergies that are, are kicking up right now, or if I'm actually coming down with a cold or something. Um, <clears throat> I know my daughter was sick, uh, last week and, and her mom. So I imagine <laughs> it's going to be hitting me here at some point. Uh, today we have, uh, Michelle Verog and Michelle is a, uh, she had a, a kidney transplant when she was a, a kid or or younger, and she's also had West Nile. But I know Michelle pretty well because Michelle and I, after this interview, uh, she was a branding coach, consultant, um, expert, and uh, I joined her her branding hub uh, to kind of learn about my own brand and, and kind of where I wanted to go with it. And, you know, I'd already done all my stuff. And so I was basically just trying to, to learn a little bit more about <clears throat> online presence and, and uh, you know, like social media presence and how, how that all kind of works and like, what am I doing? What am I doing wrong? Um, so that's how I know Michelle. And, uh, yeah, it was a good conversation. Uh, she has a lot of good information, uh, especially, you know, in her, um, her branding hub thing that she does that I'm a part of, uh, it's really, really informational and she's, uh, actually given a bunch of freebies too, um, and stuff. So that'll all be available in the show notes, go down there. I think content calendar, uh, a couple of other items as well. And then, you know, 
you could always head over to the branding hub. And if you have any kind of, uh, you know, um, like if you're out there and you have, and you don't, not really sure what your brand is or like, like, how do you, like, how do you even figure out what direction to take your brand once you figure out what it is? Like, you know, the coloring, the, you know, their, their target, uh, clientele and, and, you know, the kind of coloring that you want to have and all of the, you know, wording and everything else, you know, the values and the, and, and the vision behind your brand, all of that stuff is, is what she, um, teaches. So if that's something that you're interested in, go down to the show notes and, uh, hit the, uh, hit her information, um, to the branding hub. And, uh, she has, you know, subscription, it's a subscription service and there's, uh, tons of, uh, content in there already for mastermind classes and stuff like that, that we've done. I've done one on podcasting. It's in there. Um, so yeah, uh, I think you'll enjoy what I've got for you today. Uh, very informative, her story is uh, is uh, interesting as well. Um, you know, ha- dialysis and you know having to deal with all of that. You know, and then the the West Nile was interesting. I've I'd never. Uh, I mean, you hear about it, but like never hear of anybody that actually had it uh, or talk to somebody that actually had it. So um, enough of me rambling on. Uh, let's get to the show. This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast, and I'm your host, Sean Dustin. Today, we are talking to Michelle, and I can't... Virag? Yes, Virag. All right. Michelle Virag, and she responded to one of my posts that we're talking. I was asking for guests that would like to share their uh, bottom or life struggle uh, on the podcast, and she was one that uh, responded. So, hi, Michelle. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me on your podcast today. I'm excited about it. You're welcome. Is this one of your first ones? Uh, No, I've done a few this month, actually. So I think this might be around my 10th one for the month. So getting on to more. So it's pretty good. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's cool. Um. Yeah, well, everybody's basic. I mean, I didn't expect to get as uh, as much response when I put those uh those those ads out or the posts out, but everybody's uh stuck at home, so I got I got bombarded <laughs> with all all kinds of uh requests. So good on me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's a it's a great way to be able to share my story, and exactly, everyone's just stuck at home, so they're like, "Yeah, sure, I'll be a guest on a podcast. Why not?" <laughs> <laughs> That's the new thing. All the kids are doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, tell me a little bit about yourself, and uh, uh, you have here that you've gone through a number of different hardships. Uh, the one that stands out to me that. Uh, it would be kidney failure and a transplant at eight. How was that? Uh, yeah. So when I was eight years old, what happened was I had strep throat and the virus from the strep throat actually traveled into my kidneys. Um, and then the doctor found it um, too late by the time they figured out what was wrong with me and what was what was sick. Like I just felt like I had the flu. I was throwing up. I was really sick. And, um, and then my family doctor told me I had to go to the hospital. And by the time the doctors found out what was wrong, uh, both my kidneys had already failed. Um, so I ended up having to have a transplant at eight years old. And so that was, so you had, both of them or just one of them trans uh, one of them replaced it's just one you only need to you can just live with one kidney so i just had one of them transplanted and uh, it was actually from my uncle so he and he's still living so he only has one kidney right now wow uh so i mean are there any like uh, precautions that you have to take if uh, if you only have one kidney. So like, do they suggest that you don't drink much or 
uh, you limit your alcohol or anything that's going to, that's going to put uh, undue stress on, on that organ? Oh yeah, for sure. Well, um, what happened was I actually, I had a, a transplant when I was eight and I was actually good, like relatively normal in quotation marks um, from eight till the age of about 23. So just after I finished university and then I actually had to go back on dialysis because that kidney failed. So right now I'm, I've been back on dialysis for probably about the past 11 to 12 years now. Um, so there's a number of precautions I have to take. I have to be careful how much fluids I'm drinking. I can only have, um, a limited amount of fluid. Um, there's a number of foods I have to be very, uh, cautious about such as, um, mostly citrus things, uh, bananas, chocolate, which really sucks. Um, alcohol I do have to be careful with some of it like I can't have beer because of the phosphates in beer and I believe there's phosphates in red wine as well so I have to be careful with that which sucks because I like wine and cold beer is always good on a summer day so (laughs) it's tough but um I've it's been my life for the past 10 years and when I was younger too so it's just something I've gotten used to and I can cheat a little bit, but I just have to be careful how much. <laughs> wow. That's a, that's quite a, quite an adjustment uh, going from not having to do that all the way to 23 and then for 12 years. So like how, how often do you have to go and, uh, and, and get on the uh, dialysis machine? Um, Well, currently I'm doing a type of dialysis called hemodialysis. So what happens is I'm actually able to do it at home. I have a machine that I hook up to um, every other night from home and I generally do it while I'm sleeping. So it's about seven and a half to eight hours that I'm um, doing my treatment for every other night. But just being able to do it from home is such a huge relief and freedom. Um, Part of last year, I actually I had to switch um, the type of dialysis treatments that I was doing. And I first had to start doing them at the hospital and was training to do them at the hospital. So it was a lot of long days having to spend at the hospital for pretty much the entire summer. Um, and in Winnipeg, we only get two and a half months of summer. So <laughs> most of my summer was spent at the hospital last year, uh, which was not fun. And um, it was just a lot of training. And But now that I'm able to do it at home, it's just a lot more, a lot more freeing for sure. So I was just doing an episode. I think it was the not the last one, but the one before that, where it uh, says special uh, report and about uh, co- uh, coronavirus or COVID nineteen um, game changer. And it's uh, an inventor that invented something that hooks that he could retrofit onto a uh, dialysis machine and oxygenate the blood uh, to help uh, people that are in that that acute phase of uh, respiratory uh, distress, you know, when they, when their lungs start filling up with fluid because of the, uh, your, your, your body fighting it. Um, and so I, I'm not a doctor. And so it, it was a really interesting episode and, and what he's trying to do. And I, the only reason I bring it up is because I was talking about dialysis machines not too long ago. <laughs> wow. So, that's re- Is that, was that specifically for uh, like people on dialysis that have gotten COVID-19? No, it was, it's actually, uh, it, it hasn't been approved yet, but he's, he, uh, he was, there was, he was looking for something that can be done quickly to help some of these people that are having, that are in that, uh, in that part or in that process of infection. 
and he was looking for an easy way to uh, combine an already existing uh, oxygenation uh, machine uh, and and the uh, you know what I'm 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 horrible at this I'm not gonna I'm gonna screw it all up I know I am uh, <laughs> if you're out there listening go take a look take a listen to the episode it's a really interesting on how he he retro is the plan to retrofit but i mean he has to get approval and all this other stuff from the fda yeah. and, and so he was just really trying to get the uh, information out there for people to hear and you know possibly you know ring your your uh congressman or somebody to say hey look there's this new uh there's this thing out there that needs to be approved and would help save lives so Anyways, that's was- incredible. Yeah, even just yeah, just so many people. But I know there's so many, so much like red tape, like trying to get something approved medically. But I mean, as it should be too, right? Yeah. You don't just want anything approved. All right, I'm gonna have to do something real quick. This is really bugging me, but I'm, I can't. I'm not gonna leave the. I'm not gonna leave the conversation. But I just finished lunch, and I have. I have. Yeah. I had ah there it goes. I had a piece of pepper in my in my teeth. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I actually couldn't see it from my camera, but that's okay. <laughs> no, I can see it. My camera's on a big screen right in front of me, and I'm like, uh, every time yeah. I, every time I'm smiling, it's like this big black thing. Right? I'm like, holy shit, how am I gonna how am I gonna do this sly? And I'm like, well, you know what? There's really not gonna be a sly way to do it. You're just, you're, you're just gonna have to show everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, what else you got here? You got uh, you had you had West Nile. I did have West Nile. Yes. How'd you get that? Um, well, I'm assuming it was from a mosquito, but I had actually taken a trip. It was my senior year of high school that I got it. And um, I had a few weeks before I got it, I had taken a trip to uh, Saskatchewan, which is in Canada. It's just the next province over uh, from where I am. And I was visiting friends and we did a camping trip there where we went out. And that's the time that I'm thinking I got it just because I was out in the woods and uh, we spent the night like outside. So that's the time I'm thinking I got it. And that was a pretty uh, traumatic time in my life because I um, initially got a fever. Well, I started having a headache the day that I got it. And, um, and I believe it was the next day or so I got a fever. Um, and because of my health background, anytime I get a fever, it's kind of a big deal. So, um, uh, my mom took me to, uh, the emergency room and, uh, while I was waiting to see one of the doctors uh, in one of the rooms, I actually started having seizures And most people tend to block out their seizures. Like if someone has epilepsy, they tend to black them out. But I actually physically remember having them and remember my body going stiff and rigid and just convulsing like uncontrollably, which is very scary. (laughs) Um, And that's pretty much the last I remember. And I was in the hospital for about two and a half weeks. Um, I don't remember anything else about being in the hospital. Um, I just remember coming home and I was home. I missed about a month of school. Um, I almost didn't graduate, but I worked hard to, um, to be able to get caught up and graduate with friends. But Um, I even remember thinking once, like, no one came to visit me in the hospital, but my family was like, what are you talking about? There are people there, like, every single day to see you, but I just blacked out the entire time. Like, I don't remember a single thing except for the day when I went into emergency, and that's it. Wow. You don't hear about, you don't hear about that one too often, the West, (laughs) the West Nile virus. I remember back. No, you don't. I was actually, um, I was interviewed on the news a few times here locally just because it was 
such a rare thing and not many people got it or got it in such a severe way that I got it. Yeah. What are the, what are the odds that you, uh, that you run across the wrong (laughs) mosquito? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I hope that mosquito is dead though now. (laughs) Yeah. Right. I mean, God, you've spent a lot of time in the hospitals. It seems like. Yes, Uh, I definitely have. Um, I'm definitely very familiar with the processes and the nurses and the medical staff and yeah, we have a number of hospitals here in Winnipeg, and I think I've I think I've been a main patient at at least three of them. Um, and yeah, and that's just here here. So you're so you're on a first name basis with a lot of them. They know you by by well, Michelle. Hey, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, good, yeah. Good, good to see you. Not good to see you. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. And then here's, and and one that really that you have here that kind of would tie sort of into my podcast and actually why I started it was, uh, uh, struggling with uh, addiction, but not you, you weren't struggling with it. You were, uh, on the opposite end of it, uh, dealing with a alcoholic, uh, significant other, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that was a very difficult time. Um, we had actually just moved in together when he started, um, abusing alcohol. So we had just gotten like a new house together. Uh, we were doing, it was just after we were doing a lot of renovations on the house. Um, so I know that it was just a lot for him, um, but he is not one that handles stress very well. So it was just very um, difficult to live in that situation. Um, And then also while he was going through his substance abuse last year and I was going through a lot of medical challenges and changes as well. It was just, um, it was very difficult for me to handle both of them like mentally. (laughs) And yeah, we ended up having to break things off at the end of last year, just because it was, I wasn't able to handle the stress of, of him and his substance abuse as well as, me going through my own medical stuff. It was just a time when I had to say, like, I have to put myself first right now. Um, so I were, we are still friends. I just do still talk to him because I still want to try to be a support person for him. Um, although I don't tolerate it when he does uh, start drinking, I've kind of um, made a line and said, like, I can't cross that line anymore, but um, I am a support person for him. Like, if he ever does need to talk or if he needs someone to talk to or anything like that. Well, that's good. You know, they they, they say that, uh, well, Johan Hari says, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, uh, but he talks about, you know, addiction, uh you know, the, the opposite of addiction is uh, connection, but also that uh, the, the present way that we deal with addiction uh, in the, the justice system and, and with people in general is, you know, we tend to shame uh, people that are struggling with those types of uh, illnesses and how that really is not the way to uh, deal with it because you push them further into, uh, you know, down whatever hole that they're in or, you know, cycle that they're in and start spiraling downwards that it just, it it adds to, to that. But you also, you like, like you, you have to know when to, uh, sort of like, I don't know, man, like you said, put the, put the line in the sand to where it's like, Hey, you know, I'm here to, I'm here to support you and help you, you know, as a person, but you know, if you're going to continue down this road, uh, you know, we're going to have to figure out a different way of, of, of me being a support person for you because it's not helping me and you're not helping you either. (laughs) 
Yeah. And that, yeah, exactly. And that, and that's kind of what it came down to where, um, I tried to be there as much as possible and, um, and still be, and still be that person for him because I knew that it wasn't, it wasn't, it's an illness and it's not his choice for him to be making these decisions. But yeah, at the same time, like there's, there's a point where I do have to say like, okay, like I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like I need to help myself first. And yeah, unfortunately that's just kind of what it came down to. So of all of the things that you've been through, uh, what would you, what would you say that your, what, what personal struggle or, or, or bottom in your life did you learn the most from or that, that taught you, uh, that taught you how to, um, resiliency? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, Oh, I mean, when you're a kid going through an illness, it's it's a unique experience because you're forced to grow up really fast um, and you're just going through all these things with your friends because like your friends don't understand medical things <laughs> when you're eight years old and when you can barely even understand them yourself. Um, so I guess I've just kind of learned that from a very young age, just to try to be like optimistic, no matter what happens and just pushing through and being resilient because there you may ha- be at a bottom but if you are at a bottom like you only have to go up from there um but i definitely say this past year has been very trying because i feel like it was a major shift in my own life that i had to experience from going from uh when i was on peritoneal dialysis going to uh hemodialysis Sorry, there's a dog in the background. Um, but making that shift, but then as well, uh, carrying the weight of another person that is also going through an addiction issue as well. So I think that's the first time where I was really carrying the weight of it wasn't just my own um, my own stuff that I was going through, but another person's as well which is extremely heavy um, and it's extremely difficult to work through uh, mentally and emotionally and physically and just all of it. Um, So I definitely had to do a lot of work on myself mentally um, with like mindset and uh, meditation and exercise and um, just a lot. So I think, and like, plus I'm running my own business as well. So being able to do all that, like, and just barely, like, I felt like my brain was just like barely staying afloat, um, through everything. So I think this past year has really taught me a lot about myself and a lot about, um, how like mentally strong I am and how, um, and just different ways I can work through those issues as well, like different techniques I needed to introduce in my own life, um, like breathing techniques and, um, and just mental talk techniques that I've had to implement with myself to be able to make myself stronger. That's great. Yeah. It's almost like you had a, uh, you know, it, Although you, you lost a relationship, you didn't, you didn't necessarily lose a friend, but it was a necessary, uh, a a necessary roadblock. It sounds like for you to, uh, have gotten some adversity and, and learned to, you know, cause usually when, as people, when we get put into situations, we, a lot of times don't think that we can handle something but it takes the situation and being put in it into it to realize that, Hey, you know, Oh, maybe I, maybe I am strong enough or maybe I, you know, maybe, maybe I'm, I can do this. Um, 
you know, and you know, we, 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 as people love to be in the familiar, you know, uh, yes. we, <laughs> we, we don't like to go outside of our comfort zone very often. And that really is a limiting, uh, a limiting thing for people, you know, cause when you don't get outside of your comfort zone, you don't grow. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, to add on top of it, I have anxiety as well. So I'm very familiar of not being comfortable. And that's exactly what the past year was all about was it was everything just seemed like outside of my control. And it was just so hard to try to like rein everything back in (laughs) and just so that I could try to like take control of things again. But yeah, when things are outside of your control and happening, even though you don't want them to happen, like, yeah, it's hard to kind of wrap your mind around that sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't, I could, I a hundred percent agree with you. Uh, what's your, what's your business? What do you do? Uh, I do personal branding and social media strategies. So I started my business about three years ago. Um, I should have started sooner than that, but it came when at the right time anyway, but just because of the medical, uh, my medical situation, um, it's always been difficult for me to, um, work that typical nine to five job just because of treatments and appointments um, and things like that. So when I was let go from a digital marketing job and when I was let go from that job, I just finally said to myself, like, it was me taking control. It was like, I just need to be in control of my future and of my own success because I was just kind of tired of going to different jobs and having someone else in control of, of if I'm going to get a raise or not, or if I'm going to be employed that day or not, or like what my tasks were, things like that. So I've, once I was let go from that job, when I was laid off, I just said, now's the right time to start my job. So, or start out on my own. <laughs> and then uh, that's when I started my business. So it's been, I haven't looked back since it's been pretty much the best thing ever. I can now work my own hours and work around appointments and treatments. And if I need a day off, I can take a day off. So it's been great. Yeah, you don't have to you don't have to explain to anybody anything anymore. Like to a boss, oh yeah, you know, I gotta go do this, I gotta go do this, and you know, you you're thinking in the back of your mind, okay, do they you know what I mean? It's just it's it's I mean exactly. I, I would exactly it's a super personal thing, you know, anything that has to do with your health yeah. and, and you know, whether it's you know, failing you or whatever whatever's happening, it's still it's a personal thing. And I mean I mean, do you really wanna have to disclose all of your personal, you know, health information to your employer. So yeah, I I probably would have done the same thing. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, for sure. And it's exactly like you say, like, I don't have to explain things anymore, which is such a relief because I mean, in the beginning, people like employees are really understanding. I'm very open and honest about my situation. But then after like a few months or after a year, or a couple of years, once I start saying, talking about like appointments and treatments, I almost get eye rolls. It seems like, like, it's like, okay, another appointment, you know, and it's, yeah, it's just, it's nice to be on my own, on my own terms now. Yeah. So what, what, what does a day look like for somebody who's a digital marketer and brand, uh, person? Because I'm horrible at, at social media. Uh, my, my brand, I'm, hor- I'm horrible at that too. Like I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good at, at doing the interviews, just all the other stuff that goes yeah. around with it. I'm, I'm horrible at it. Yeah, well, for me, it's a lot of um, definitely a lot of time spending on social media. (laughs) Um, I spend the my main focus has been uh, Facebook and LinkedIn for the past uh, couple of years. 
And because I realized when I first started my business, I tried to be everywhere all at once, but I soon came to realize that that takes a lot more (laughs) effort than you think. And it's better just to focus in one or two areas where your clientele is. Um, So I spend a lot of time just posting. I talk a lot about my story and uh, my own background. I share a lot of valuable tips with my audience as well. Um, I network in a lot of Facebook groups um, to share like just tips and valuable information. Um, I'm always messaging people in my audience as well to connect and build relationships. Um, I just heard recently, I think earlier today that I really liked that relationships are the new, are are the new currency. Um, So because I think that that's what really it takes for you to stand out on social media. It's that it's not just that you're posting the same content that everyone else is posting, but it's that you're also messaging those people outside of just the newsfeed and those you know, like engagement comments, um, but that you're actually messaging them and starting conversations with them and getting to know them as people, um, because that's when people are really going to start to connect with you and start to like relate to what you're talking about, relate to you as a person as well. I have a story. I have have actually a story recently that just, uh, that kind of, uh, talks about that. Uh, there's a, a listener in Australia and she's been listening for a while. Uh, we, we talk back and forth sometimes on, on messenger and she listened to my fourth episode and she listened to some of the other ones, but she just, I guess she'd like, all right, well, I'm going to, I'm going to start listening to from the beginning now. So she started at the beginning, hit the fourth one. And one of the, uh, the, the, um, the, one of the guests that I had on, on, uh, uh, for that episode talked about, uh, uh, mental illness and, uh, mental health. And so she really related to her and she hit me up and, and the person that I had, I had interviewed, she didn't really want to have any, you know, don't put my social media stuff out there. Don't, you know, I'm just, I'm here just to tell my story and that's it. And if it helps somebody, it helps somebody. Uh, she, but the, the, the lady from uh, Australia, she, you know, was, hey, I'd, I'd love to be able to connect with, uh, you know, Rhiannon. Do you, do you have a way to connect with her? And I'm like, uh, let me see. It's been a while, like almost a year since I did the episode. Let me see if I can dig up her uh, her information. And I did. I shot her her uh, uh, her, her Facebook uh, deal so she could request her. And then I. And I'm like, ah, you know what, man, maybe I should have asked, asked her first. And then, so I, I went and, and messaged her myself and I'm like, Hey, you know, uh, explain the situation. And she was like, Oh yeah, I just, uh, let me, I, I refused the request cause I didn't know who it was, but now that I know who it was, I'll go ahead and, and re, you know, whatever. And they made yeah. the, they made the connection. But I mean, it was just as simple as that is like, you're engaging with, with, with the people. So, I mean, and it's really easy to do when you're a small show and you, you're not really that popular yet because you're not getting a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of that. But I could imagine if you, if I was a, a big show, uh, where I had a lot of listeners and a lot of followers and people that were, you know, trying to engage with me all the time where that could get difficult to do. Well, um, yes and no. I mean, I can easily think of a way if you were to start a Facebook group around your podcast, it would be a great way for people to interact with each other and be able to connect with each other. And, um, and then even like sharing the episodes inside the Facebook group as well. And then that's just another way for people to uh, see the episodes and then also be able to connect with the guests and connect with each other as well. And being able to, um, like comment on the videos and sharing their own experiences and their own stories, um, one of the reasons when I first started my business that I absolutely loved is 
whenever I would meet with business owners, whether it was just like, um, like a, like a video call or, um, like meeting for coffee. One of the first things I always asked was like, why did you get, why did you start your business? Like, like, why did you get into your, why did you start your business? And I've always just found those stories like so fascinating because everyone has their own reason and everyone kind of has hit that turning point um, as to why they started their business. But everyone comes from like a different background. And I think that once people start sharing those types of stories and even the thing with mental illness, like, um, like myself, I have anxiety and my ex, he had anxiety and depression as well. So I know that when you get into that state, like you can feel like you are the only person out there that is feeling that way. So I can definitely see how an episode like that would, um, would definitely like connect a lot of people because when you hear someone else share their story, then other people can think like, Oh, you know what? Like, it's okay. It's okay that I'm feeling this way. Like, or that person gets it. They understand like what my brain is thinking because sometimes it's just like, you feel like no one knows how your, how your brain is feeling (laughs) when you're in that kind of mental state. So yeah, I could for sure see like if you had something like a Facebook group, that would be a really awesome way for you to have like your members and your audience members um, and your guests and everyone like connect together and be able to share more of those, those kind of stories with each other. I do have one. Uh, Maybe I'm not doing it right. So, I mean, I I have a face, I I have a Facebook group and I post all my episodes in there, but I don't get a lot of, uh, there's not a whole lot of interaction, uh, that's happening. It just seems like it's uh, another place for me to post that has, you know, and, and the views that I'll get off of stuff that I'll post is like maybe 16 views and there's 184 people in there. So a lot of them aren't, aren't engaging. So I don't, I don't know. It's just like, God, I mean, what, what's the, what's the, uh, uh, what's the formula, man? I need the formula. <laughs> <laughs> well, there there could be a bunch of different factors. There could be um, like looking at the links, like how many links you have back to your Facebook group, like how you're directing people back to your Facebook group, um, the type of content that you're posting, like if you're only posting your episodes or if you're also posting like engaging questions and stories and things like that. Um, And again, just like messaging people too, like outside of the Facebook group, but actually getting them into messenger and connecting with them and, and just, and talking with them as well is another really great way to more build up that relationship and get them interested in the group as well. Um, And depending what the group, name actually is because for people to find your group it's really good to have a lot of keywords that people are uh, looking for um so it might not be like your podcast name but it might be um i don't know something different like um personal uh, development i can't even think right now personal development (laughs) self-improvement like key these are things that even when my podcast when i when i publish it like the key words like their tags or all that stuff it's like man i'm so i'm so i don't i don't know what any of that that crap means (laughs) (laughs) so i mean i try to throw some stuff in there that i would think that you know but i just i don't i don't have an understanding of how all that stuff works so as a digital marketer what would so let's just say i i wanted to be a client of yours and you you see all of the stuff that I have and I go, okay, well, you know what, here, here's my link tree. Take a look at what's on it, where it goes and and how, and, 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 you know, what that is. So do you kind of like, would you go in and kind of dissect what I already have? And and yeah, for sure. Like when I'm working one-on-one with clients, I always do, um, an audit first. So I take a look at like what their offers are, um, where they're currently visible, whether, uh, like which platforms they're on and what they're currently posting for content as well. And how people are engaging and interacting with certain types of content. For example, 
um, say, for example, okay, you post, um, you shared like a YouTube video and you get like two likes and no comments. And then maybe another day you post like a really thought engaging question and you get like 57 comments or something. So I'd be like, okay, let's look at your content and let's see you're like your, these questions are doing really good. Maybe we can do more of this. But then we would also rework the other types of content that isn't doing so well. And we look at that and say, okay, well, how can we do this, but maybe differently so that we can get more engagement with your audience? Um, so yeah, so I really start out with doing like a, an audit, an overall social media brand audit, and then just figuring out ways how we can improve that and improve what you're already doing um, and start looking at how to implement those those steps and also looking at the tools that you might need to to um, to improve yourself as well like maybe you need social media scheduling tools or maybe um, there's like a copywriting service or I don't know different things like that or like a different um, website service and then uh we'll then i we also do some uh tech training as well because i know that i'm very tech savvy (laughs) i've done so much different work with like websites and stuff but i get that people not everyone is that way and a lot of people need very like more simplified instructions so I help to um, simplify kind of the the different tools as well and show you ways that you can use a certain tool, but in an easy way or just how you use it like for your own brand and for your own social media so that you can um, boost your brand awareness and get more people into your group and get more listeners to your podcast and uh, things like that. So so yeah, I generally create a pretty customized plan when I'm working one-on-one with people because I know it's not, I say I'm not like Walmart, like I'm not a one size fits, fits all. I like to be more of a designer in the sense that um, I like to build out a plan that's best suited for the person that I'm working with. That sounds, uh, that, that sounds good. Um, yeah, we, we may be talking. <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah, like the one like the website like i <laughs> i went to to do uh squarespace and or square it was a squarespace and squarespace, i was ta- yeah i was talking to another guy he's like yeah you know but if you really want to 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 have a really good website where you can do a lot of different things you know paywalls and all this other stuff and he's like you know you're probably going to want to have to go wordpress uh, cause it just gives you more options of, of what you can do with your site, uh, and how you can sort of break it up. And I'm just like, dude, I can't, I can't even do, I can't even do Squarespace. Are you kidding me? You know, <laughs> WordPress? That, that, that sounds even way more difficult. Just the yeah. name alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I I know so many like website designers love WordPress and I mean, yeah, if you are a word like a like a website builder, then WordPress is your jam and if you're really technical, do that, but I mean, even I had issues with WordPress when I was working at a digital marketing agency and I was like Oh yeah, I I personally <laughs> stay away from WordPress just because I find it too time consuming. I end up spending an entire day just trying to figure out like one thing to add to my website. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, well, we're about forty two minutes, so why don't you uh, go ahead and plug everything uh, where they can people can find you, your business, uh, anything that you want to promote. Sure, definitely. Um, well, I'm on uh, Facebook just under my name, Michelle Virog. You can connect with me. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, also under Michelle Virog. And I have a Facebook group. It's called Content Crushers. Um, and I'm currently, I'm about to launch a program in a couple months called uh, the Personal Branding Hub 
which will be a membership site and it's going to have, uh, I want to help a lot more business owners and entrepreneurs that are just getting started on social media and that want to get their and that want to brand themselves on social media. So I'll be having, um, there'll be master classes from influencers. I'll have video trainings and tech trainings and there'll be uh, master class calls as well. And there'll also be accountability calls and content calendars and a whole bunch of goodies. So I'll be launching that at the beginning of June. Um, and the wait list for that should be launching very soon as well. Nice. Nice. Good way to, uh, to try and have a one-stop shop, so to say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just being able to, um, help people on a larger scale as well. Amazing. Great. Great. Uh, like I said, we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit after, uh, I sign off here, but, uh, your uh, everywhere that you're going to be available and everywhere that you just said will be in the show notes as well to anybody who's out there listening and didn't catch that as well as where you can find me, uh, and my link tree. And, you know, maybe you can do more with it than I can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a new world that we're in. And, uh, like I'm a, I'm a, what, what would I be considered a gen X? So, I mean, I still, and I, I think you're, are you gen X as well? Gen X or millennial? Yeah, you probably I don't probably, know. I'm 33. Okay. So you're, 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 you're at the, I think uh, I'm right on the edge. Yeah, you're on the know. cusp, on the cusp of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, millennial and, and gen X. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I was, I, I've, I've witnessed both sides and you probably have two of, you know, pre-internet post-internet. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Kind of, you know, I, I was doing a little, I think when windows 95 came out, I was in uh, Vegas and learning how to, uh, work with computers and stuff like that and hardware and, 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 and the like, but I mean, it's changed so fast and, and so much in, in that period of time. It's like, now it's like, I have no idea. I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> take apart a, a, a computer and put it back together. And, and I mean, I probably could, but I mean, it's a lot different than when I started playing around with them. Yeah. It seems like things change every five minutes these days. Yeah. Right. Well, it was good talking to you, Michelle. I'm glad you reached out to me and uh, hopefully our listeners will, will get something useful out of this. If nothing else, if you need a, a, a digital marketer and a, a content uh, creator and manager, there you go. We got one for you. Thanks so much, Sean, for having me. This is great. You're welcome. And thank you for uh, stopping by and, and sharing your story with us. And I will will definitely be getting back to you uh, when it gets closer to uh, releasing the episode with uh, promo stuff and for you to share on your social media sites and as well. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cool. So uh, I will be talking to you soon and stay there. We're going to talk just a minute. <laughs>